a good protocol will save you from the poverty of your good intentions. Nobody cares about your good intentions. The question then is, what protocols, what processes might you use to help support people in identifying their hopes, their dreams, their frustrations, the things that piss them off, because those are opportunities to create something new. Anger is a very useful tool if we know how to work with it. This is High Tech High Unboxed. I'm Alec Patton, and you just heard the voice of Caleb Rashad, interim CEO of High Tech High. Caleb sat down with Vista Innovation and Design Academy principal Eric Chigala and High Tech High Graduate School of Education president Ben Daly to talk about school leadership and how to turn soaring rhetoric into concrete reality. This conversation happened at the 2023 Deeper Learning Conference. The write-up for this session said, this talk is for anyone who believes that schools have souls and that those souls must be tended to. And I can't say it better than that. Here's the conversation. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Check, check. My name is Ben Daly. I'm the president of the High Tech High Graduate School. Welcome to this uh, deep dive den. Deep, deep. It's a den talk. I don't know. We try to put deep into everything. I don't know. Okay. I wa so we have uh, with us to this, uh, today Eric Chigala, who's the principal of Vista Innovation Design Academy, and Caleb Rashad, who wears many hats, but also currently the interim CEO of High Tech High. Two things I wanted to share about these guys before they get started. Uh, one is they're, uh, they're our most photogenic members of the deeper learning community. I can prove this to you because if you look in your program, you will see that every single photo has one of them in the background. So that's a true story. The second thing is my colleagues asked me to moderate a session and I was like, oh, that's fine. But I was sort of like confused why they were asking me to do it. And then I saw who I was paired with and it immediately became clear why I had been given that task. So. Uh, buckle up. We already asked this, the, uh, the, the, the sound guy to turn their volume actually negative so that it, it dampens their voices. So prepare yourself. I'm sure we're going to have a good time together. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Um, thank you all for being here. We're so excited. Um, uh, Eric wanted to do push-ups because he was so excited. <laughs> wanted to run around the room. It's, it's uh, day one. I know. I'm, I know. I know. So... But we want to make sure you are here for some good reasons. And we want to try to maximize the learning opportunity for you. And we'll still probably have a lot of fun with you too. So I think what we'll ask you to do is maybe take a moment and maybe identify what was it that brought you to this DIN talk? What questions do you come in with? What are you wondering about? Or what are you seeking? I'm asking you to do this because, well, we both love to hold a mic and we can talk ad nauseum about things. And it seems wiser to me to begin with your questions and to support you on your journey. So will you take just a quick moment and maybe recall what are the questions you're coming here with what are you wondering about? What drew you to this session? And then what we'll do is we'll surface some of those and then we'll attempt to try to answer them and maybe entertain you a little bit too. So can you take a moment and just um, surface? What are you wondering about? What drew you to this session? What questions do you have? And then what we'll do is Eric and I will come to you so that you can voice the question, the wondering that you have, and then we'll start trying to answer some of those questions. Is that fair? Okay, great. So do that now. If you've got a question, just lift your hand up and let us know and we'll come to you. Eric, if you would take that yep. side. And what we'll try to do is generate three to five, five to seven questions or things you're wondering about. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the big question that's been on my mind this year is the unprecedented amount of trauma you're seeing in schools and just what the deeper learning response or how deeper learning is informed by this new context. I've got one more over here, then you've got one there. Hi, um, my question is how did you grow the high tech high? How did you grow it from elementary, middle, um, the international? How did... Thank you. 
Hello, I'm at a turnaround school for three years as a principal, and I want to know how to build a culture of thinking that students can do well in a, a predominantly Title I school, and how I can build that culture for my teachers and be a supportive administrator. Great question. Thank you for that. So we have three right now. Is there maybe one more? You got that one? <clears throat> Uh, I'd like to echo that same question, but from the other side. So I'm a teacher in a school that maybe doesn't have the most forward-thinking administrators. And so how do we come at it from the bottom? Hey, I, I, they're not here. I can say that. <laughs> We're not telling you. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one more? Excellent. Thank you so much. My question is, how can we get schools and the people who work in schools to be more humanizing um, to the, not only the students and the people in the schools, but also to the work that we're doing? Beautiful. Come on, Thank you. Come on, come on. Talk about it. Okay, one more, and then, and then, we'll, then we'll get rolling, and then we'll see if there are more questions. I'm in an AP Capstone High School, and what people believe is rigor is well that's another thing right but yeah. um how do we move people to understand deeper learning and without you know the massive coverage memorization study for the ap test right thank you thank you okay so maybe we can get started with some of those would you mind just playing back a few of them Make sure we got, so that for the whole group. Asked about mental health challenges and is deeper learning responsive to that? Um, growing high tech high? Working in a turnaround school? Um, other from the teacher or administrator perspective? Mm -hmm. How we be more humanizing? Mm -hmm. Human? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what about regular? Yeah, what about regular? Okay, so well, I mean, we're going to just kind of all try to, from different perspectives, try to address some of those questions. I mean, I'd love to have your help, particularly in terms of like the growth of high tech high. Um, I, I think I would start by maybe the, the broad question about moving people and the sort of culture that you're trying to uh, enact. Uh, first of all, I would say like there is no like silver bullet, but there are some like uh, some common practices that we know actually work. So I'm going to like I'm going to like tell a story. I'm going to try to answer it, but then I'm also going to give you some resources so that you can continue learning beyond what you just hear here. Um, so first, I'm a, I would probably name one key text that was important for me in trying to move a school of teachers, students, parents, and even the district administration who had no idea what, was, what I was talking about. Um, and the text is called Change Leadership. Change Leadership sourced from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Tony Wagner and others. Um, if you want to know the how, I don't think there's anyone here that would like argue we should have more shallow learning in school, right? Okay, fair. Okay, so then if we are working toward a more um, uh, compelling shared vision, the question becomes how do you do that? And so the Change Leadership book was like my go-to text. And literally, it walked me through what to do and the how of it. So I would definitely encourage you to do that. What I would add from my own experience in like using that text and maybe a few others um, is adults don't change behavior because of data that you show them. They also don't just think, analyze, change. That doesn't work. What has a greater chance of working is direct experience, dialogue, and reflection. Those things taken together gives you a greater opportunity for people to explore important questions together develop an understanding with each other because of that shared experience, and then make decisions um, together. Now, 
I would also add to that, as a school leader, from that perspective in particular, you have something called role position authority. It is endowed in your position, okay? So then the literature shares with us, and I'm referencing two texts right now. One is Michael Fullan's text called What's Worth Fighting For in the Principalship. A second text is the moral, the moral Imperative of Leadership. And then third, sorry, three texts. The third text is Six Secrets of Change. And in the literature, based upon empirical practice, the person who has role position authority has a responsibility to hold a moral clarity about why we show up. Why it is that we care for other people's children. There's a moral imperative there, and if you haven't like done the digging, then it's hard to articulate that. But sitting with that and un being curious about what is our moral imperative? What's our sh shared higher purpose? Even if it's not just test scores, but maybe there's something bigger that we're trying to aim for, the person who has role position authority has a responsibility to not be an empty suit, but to speak truth and invite other people into that truth with you so that it's not dictatorial, but rather democratic. Last point, and then um, maybe we can, uh, I'll ask Eric to like share a little bit and then maybe we can flip to the question about how we grew high tech high. I think the last piece is um, Paulo Freire discusses like this piece about what he calls true dialogue. He said, true dialogue, what? Why dialogue? Why true dialogue? He describes it in a couple different ways. He describes it as faithful. He describes it as authentic, like we keeping it real. Um, he describes it as hopeful. He describes it as loving, caring, commitment, okay? So one piece of advice I might offer is that as you are like trying to change the culture, as, and what I would describe is, we talk about this all the time, we're not talking about Fat Fridays or nachos and cheese on Wednesdays or something. We're not talking about staff breakfast. When I talk about culture, when we talk about culture, we're talking about how do the adults relate to one another? How do the adults grapple with uncertainty together? How do the adults solve problems address challenges and unearth opportunities together. That's a capacity thing. So I was terrible at throwing parties. Not very good at it. Well, sometimes. But um, what I really tried to attend to with my role position authority is how you show up with your colleagues. That we have a moral sort of responsibility to. Those are some things that I would add to the question about sourcing how to move folks. What would you say? I think what I heard within the questions too was this sort of theme around the humanization of schools. Like we're in the human business, but so often we are not in the human business. We're in the system structure and it sucks for everyone that is downwind from it. And so we're, as both sitting leaders, and then you may have seen the term unlocked in the description, that's a nonprofit we have where we do human-centered, liberatory design work with people. And we've used it through our school leadership experiences. So as a sitting leader, the school I'm at, it's called Long Name, and this name sucks, Vista Innovation and Design Academy, like full of buzzwords. Buzzwords are like the hemlock of public education right now. They say them, I hear them in like really high placed people with lots of authority standing up saying words and then the work that they actually do and the things that shuffle down the system don't actually lead to what those buzzwords, creativity, innovation, equity, like all of them, like really beautiful words, 
that mean nothing with the way that they're actually being used in public education today. So that long name of our school, Vista Innovation and Design Academy, we force that because we're, we're a true story of school transformation, about 30 miles north from here, where we took a school, 98% poverty, 100% uh, Latinx, 30% uh, homeless, 28% special ed, 78% ELD, like all the numbers. The acronym for Vista Innovation and Design Academy is VITA. The word VITA in Spanish means life. So we've aspired in a school, a true story of school transformation around how do you make this more about the lives of the people within the system than just school or than just work. So we, you, and back then, like this journey started 10 years ago, we're in our ninth year. It was design thinking then, now it's liberatory design. But the humanization aspect of actually asking the kids, what in the world do you want to be doing? How do we take a system that's been created by white middle-class people in our city and the systems and the structures of white middle-class like thought and make it actually where poor Latinx kids can find themselves in it? They have a voice, there's opportunity, but also the teachers were victims of the system as well. And so one of the leading questions, so a school leader, this became my job to figure out how to make this work. But we asked the teachers, what have you always wanted to do with kids that you've never been allowed to do? And it was my job to figure out the system and the structure within the system and the structure. And Caleb always reminds me that constraints build creativity. Like constraints of the system actually provide us the guardrails for which to dream and innovate and co-design along with both the children and the adults. Because mm -hmm. one of those things around buzzwords that I hear a lot, and frankly, it pisses me off, is all the students at the center. Students are the only things that matter. Students, students, students. Yes, that's why we got into the business. It's about the kids. However, if the, if the adults in the system are bogged down, if they're not inspired, if they don't want to jump out of bed every morning and go serve the children because of whatever the circumstances are, then the experience for the kids sucks. So we have to code tangentially designed for both the adults and the kids in service of the experience of the children. Mm -hmm. I think those are some like, so we found some easy ways to begin looking at the experience of the kids and the adults to make a better, more human community for everyone. Do you want to like say a little bit? Yeah? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I, I think one thing I, I would add related to, I mean, they're, clearly they're connected, teacher, school leader, humanizing. Um, I think like in my very first schools, I, I did not grow up here at High Tech High. I worked in very traditional schools that were frankly dehumanizing. Um, they had top-down leadership from the superintendent, top-down leadership from the principal. Um, the instruction, the teaching and learning was top-down. Everything was about compliance. Um, and what was helpful in um, trying to create these humanizing experience for the students was to do that first with the adults because the adults will recreate what they experience, right? So I, you, I mean, I still, and I'm kind of loud and obnoxious all the time, but like I realized like, it's not about me the genius is in the room. The question becomes, how do you help unlock people's innate talents, questions, ideas, perspectives, tastes? And it helps to have a theory of action to inform what you do. So I would name three resources for you as like um, tools okay, to like help unlock the genius in your groups that you work with. So one of them is, well, one clearly um, liberatory design. So the National Equity Project, um, which inspired a lot of our work, um, especially with the Stanford D School, um, gives us a, just like a broad framework about how to support um, humanizing the experience for people. So that's one fabulous resource, credible, and it just takes time to practice with the tools to become more fluent with it. A second body of tools comes from um, 
the National School Faculty Reform. National School Faculty Reform. If you go to nsfsomething.com, they have the tools listed there for free. That's a second source of tools, protocols. Um, a third body of tools is, um, it sounds like I'm making this up, doesn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, I think, I, I, think I, might, I may have lost my thought there. Um, it may be to come back to me in a second. Um, oh, here's another one. Um, thinking Collaborative. Um, that work comes from the Center for Adaptive Schools, which supports people, groups of people, in developing shared understanding together and making decisions together. Um, a good, we often say that um, um, a good protocol will save you from the poverty of your good intentions. Nobody cares about your good intentions, especially when you have role position authority. The question then is, what protocols, what processes might you use to help support people in identifying their hopes, their dreams, their frustrations, the things that piss them off, because those are opportunities to create something new. Anger is a very useful tool if we know how to work with it. So thinking collaborative is a very, very um, powerful set of tools and trainings, by the way. Okay, one more. Um, liberating structures. Dot com, I think it is. Uh, I don't get paid for any of this. I really should. Um, but there are, I like tools. I, I, I like the inspiration, but I want to get stuff done. And I want to make sure it's done well. And I think you do too. So there are like three or four resources there to help support you in how to um, deploy processes and protocols to support people in identifying shared hopes and dreams aspirations, and then mobilizing people forward. Caleb, can you maybe talk, because in the description, yeah. we talked about the arc of like creativity, innovation, liberation. Ah, yeah. I, yeah, that makes you happy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the question. That was a lovely setup. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, so I would maybe describe my uh, journey in maybe three chapters. The first chapter was all about compliance. Okay, okay, check it out. I thought that if kids, especially black kids, and brown kids, and poor kids, and indigenous kids, if they just mastered the standards, that they would be okay. Isn't that naive? I was, I was only 22. Um, I was a PhD kid, and I thought that if kids just mastered the standards, that they would be okay. Well, we know that's not true. Part one for me, chapter one, is about compliance. The second chapter was about creativity and innovation, right? Yeah. How can we work in such a way that supports the creative and innovative spirit of people to create better things, better experiences? I think the shortcoming of that, in my point of view, um, is that slavery, for example, was a creative endeavor. It created value for somebody. So you can be creative and lack humanity. You can be creative and have a complete blind eye to another human's God-given right to exist. <laughs> so the third chapter for me, is kind of where I'm now, is about this um, arc of equity, justice, and liberation, and really reclaiming some things that were lost to me um, in this country and trying to reclaim them intentionally. And so I might offer to you wherever you might be on your journey or wherever your community might be, like hopefully we're moving beyond compliance and maybe at least toward developing uh, the creative spirit of people. And depending upon the communities that you serve, perhaps you can develop that creative spirit in such a way as to begin pursuing issues of justice. Because most times, it is a lack of confidence, a lack of belief, a lack of uh, efficacy that a group may have. By building creative confidence through processes, you can support people to take more courageous action.
in pursuit of justice, equity, and liberation. Um, well, otherwise it could be much more difficult to do so. Um, I want to make sure I'm touching on some of the key questions here. Ah, yeah, thank you for bringing that one back. I'm sorry. Um, if you, <laughs> I'm so sorry. No, I mean, it, it's so hard because we, we love our work. We signed up for this for a reason, and then we get trapped in this space, and we're like, oh, my God, is this my life? And you're trying to figure out what can I do. So what I would offer is to find at least one other teacher. Um, it can help you not feel so alone. If you've got, if you don't have role position authority, um, is to find one other colleague. They're like these little small pockets of resistance. And there's a beauty in subtle resistance. Maybe you're not overthrowing the system. <laughs> it's okay. Um, I'm reminded that there's a beautiful text um, called Fugitive Pedagogy. Queen Mother uh, Lisa Delpit was here with us just before um, COVID, and she was sharing with us, she did a, you know, she's marvelous and beautiful, um, and she's one of our elders now, and, she, and we were asking, what do we do in this time where there is such direct oppression, uh, direct suppression of people just being curious about the world and, them, and their lives and their ancestry and people's contributions in the world. Well, she said a couple things, which I thought I'm gonna share with you. One is, um, book bannings are not new. Um, school board stacking is not new. And neither is curriculum narrowing. That's not new. She said, Caleb, go back and study your history. And this is why that history part is so important. Um, who controls the history controls the present and the future. And there was a time where I was like, I didn't, I didn't know to go look at my history. I didn't know where to go find it. Um, so she pointed me to a text called Fugitive Pedagogy by Jarvis Gibbons. He's a brother from Harvard, researcher. And he describes the work of Carter G. Woodson. By the way, it's very embarrassing because I've got two masters and a doctorate degree and I had never heard of Carter G. Woodson's work on purpose. I wasn't supposed to know that. Um, and what um, Queen Mother Lisa Delpit said to us was, one, study your history because you will know that these things aren't new. Two, what were your people's responses? What did the people during that time do in response to the bannings in 1915 when Carter G. Woodson wrote um, the Negro in Our History. And that textbook was in every school in the South. And then white folks saw, oh my God, they got this book in our Negro schools. Start freaking out and banned the book back in 1915. Well, what Carter G. Woodson did and his associates like Mary McLeod Bethune and others, what they did was they built a network. They called it the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. They did that in 1915, the same time of the Klan marching in Washington and birth of a nation in the White House and hanging Negroes left and right every day, like weekly in this country. That's what they did in that context. So every time I get in my feelings, like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. Get out your feelings, fam. Recognize that it wasn't just black folks, it was black and white folks who were working on shit, to, working on things together. You see what I'm saying? So then, oh, so what they did was they started building networks underground to help support one another. So I might, sorry, it's a bit of a bird walk, apologize. But what I would, might suggest to you is that it doesn't have to be everyone. If you're in a place where you can find one other ally who can be a little respite of resistance for you, find that person and um, resist together. What other questions are coming up for you? If not, what I can do is maybe pose a question 
And then I definitely want to make sure we've got time to answer the question about how to grow high tech high. That was a more of a technical question, but it, maybe there's a good story there too that you can share. Uh, ben has been here since the very beginning. Do you want to like uh, s say a little bit about that? Yeah, I was. Uh, there is a technical. Like, I, I was thinking like that. What's the joke? How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? It's like how do you grow to sixteen schools like one building at a time? So there is like a sort of technical answer of. We had a school, and then we had a second school, and then we had a third school, and there was just like a progression around that. But I think one thing that made that question made me think about is what's been hard about going from 200 kids to 6,300 kids. So we're still pretty small, but we feel a lot bigger than we did when we were 200 kids and 12 teachers, and now we have you know, over 400 teachers. And I just think, how do you transmit culture over time? How do you wrestle with how do you hold on to the things that are important but also how do you let go of things that you didn't have quite right and there's just so I mean I could take a think of a thousand stories about that so there's just like a lot this is like a, this would be like a long therapy session just for me at this point but <laughs> I for me this question of how do you spread really effective practices across a, a system of our size but at the same time not having a top-down management approach there's like there's a lot there that i'm really uh interested in and we can anyone wants to talk about more of that i'd love to talk afterwards i was just i was thinking back to when you were talking about like nacho parties and stuff oh, yeah. and culture because yeah. when i look on twitter i see like the friday nacho parties and i see all these other things which are great and they bring people together like that's an important aspect of culture but when we talk about like actual culture that changes the lives of humans within the system, both the adults and the kids, it's like, it's so much deeper. And so I think about like the organizational aspects of culture. I think about like, why do we actually exist? I think about those protocols that you referenced and how do we have conversations with one another so that I can present something to you and your feelings don't get hurt and we can have an actual rational conversation around it. Mm -hmm. I think about the why of the work that we're trying to do. So when, like even when we use those buzzwords that we talked about and when people are saying creativity and the ability to push back and say, that's fantastic, we want all kids to be creative. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to us? What does it look like when the kids actually engage in that? Mm -hmm. How do we foster and grow that within the adults? Mm -hmm. At our school, we have a, a slide and we show parents, we talk about it as adults, we talk about it with the kids, because innovation is in the name of our title of our school. And that's like one of the, equity is like the worst buzzword because it does so much damage when not actually follow through, because equity is so important. Innovation as well, like people don't know what they're talking about. I've lost friendships with other principals. And to have a friendship as a principal is already a big deal because there's, it's like island work already. So to lose those friendships is, is, is hurtful. But I've lost friendships because I'll see these great like, things on social media. And people are like, oh, we're doing these innovative things for kids. And we're, you know, we're changing our, our tagline at our school. Our public tagline is innovate, design, create. That was hot nine years ago. Now it's lame. Our behind the scenes tag word is to kick the ass or to kick the shit out of generational poverty in our neighborhood. And so like, what are the real things that we're trying to do? And the, where I've lost friendships over is I see people put out like, we're doing these innovative practices for children. Great, I wanna know more about that. What are you doing? Oh, well, we're allowing them voice and choice. Fantastic, can you tell me more about that? No, unable to go any further than the words voice and like low hanging fruit. Low-hanging fruit is great when we use it to actually like fill ourselves and fill the system. But when we just use the words and we don't have a culture that actually understands where we can ask questions that is built upon the things where we don't have a culture that has sort of this like, where like leadership is decentralized and you still got to have a person at the top because when the shit hits the fan, there's a person that the press is going to go to. Like that's a reality. But the things that actually happen at the school, how are those decided upon? How do you bring the teachers into that to help, and the, even kids, to help decide what we're doing and building the culture? And so let me kind of build on that, especially answering these questions about like culture and stuff. I want to you know, um, ask you about this one. Like, clearly, I, I wonder about how you've used design with the parent community 
if we if we believe like the community is a central part of co-developing, co-designing the vision for the school, holding that school accountable to the, to the outcomes for their children, how uh, how did how did design, if at all, play into your approach with parents? Yeah. So one of the things we talked about with our school turnaround is where it was and now it's like this fantastic great place where a political hot potato for the school board because the ugly like there's an 800 kid waiting list to get into the school and there's all this ugly stuff that rises like well what about the merit of the children who go shouldn't it be kids who like ugly things that the public brings up and so one of the things that people ask us is you talk about moral imperative We've had people come through, we have about a thousand visitors a year come through the school. And there's this one tour group, our second year from Douglas County, Colorado. And there's this principal at the end and he just looked like he didn't really give a shit about what was going on. And I'm very sensitive. And so I walked up to him at the end, I put my arm around him. I said, you know, I can, I can tell like you got very little out of the tour that we presented today. And like, is there anything I, before you go on your way to the next school, is there anything that I can help you with? He said, very wealthy district, he said, no, 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 your story's great. I don't see my kids in your kids. My building is not your building, and I don't see my teachers in your teachers. He said, you had a clear moral imperative for change. I don't have that. Our kids test well, they do blah, 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 so I'm having struggle, like why would we do something different? Fast forward, year five, he was back on another trip. And you ever like know these people where like you can recognize someone, but you don't know why you recognize them. So for whatever reason, he came through on another tour. And at the end, he came up to me. He said, hey, because we actually like, is a bad thing. We actually hit gentrification. And so we had to institute district level policies to make sure that we were like serving who we were developed to see. And so... He said, you know, we had the, I was here in your second year. Now it's three years later. And now I see like blonde hair, blue eyed kids. And like you have some like a little bit of different teaching staff and you have some furniture that has like wheels on it. I now see more of like my school in you. What is your moral imperative now? I'm like, what the F are you talking about? It turns out what we did for really poor Latinx kids because it's the right thing, turns out to be wildly popular with everybody else. And so we have this conversation around what we did, and going to your question, when we developed the school, we used, at that time, design thinking, we would it'd be more liberatory now. We had to sit down with parents, the kids. We have a 7-Eleven in our corner. Every like rough school has a 7-Eleven near it somewhere. We went down and talked to the guys, the owners, who had a lot to say about it was called Washington Middle School. I always tell people the older the dead president in America that school is named after, the more issues and problems for which it has. And so we asked, we actually sit and have conversations. And what came out with our pedagogy, the number one thing, kids were, in our district, every middle school has eight periods. At Washington Middle School, they had created nine periods so kids could have more interventions because everyone's double dosed, everyone has interventions, everyone has more math. Mm -hmm. We decided based on talking with parents and kids and alumni and the guys at 7-Eleven, our first intervention was going to become engagement. That the poor kids, the suffering children, had to actually have an opportunity to see themselves in the school and to be a part of it before anything else would ever matter. And it turns out that when you treat people like humans, everybody really likes that. Everybody. Because it feels good and it feels right. And so we continue with culture. The, you know, we, is it, in anyone's schools, do, is vaping still a thing? Okay, so we brought parents in. Did a design challenge with parents and kids tangentially around vaping. You know, it, the, what I love about design is the how might we question, how acknowledges there's an issue or something we need to work around, and it's nobody's fault. Eric, get over your sensitivity. It's nobody's fault that the kids are vaping in the bathroom. Might is the optimism that there is a solution for it if we all work together to create th those solutions. And so we use that frame, how might we, and it takes as the leader like, 
they're not pointing fingers at me. There's kids and we're in society and like rough stuff in society. How might we go about improving the lives of everyone here? I think for, for us, how are we doing on time? You got a question? Okay, okay but, uh, yeah, Mayor should ask the good, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Um, so what, what I might suggest, oh yeah, yeah. Um, do you wanna just say it in your own words one more time? I'd just like to hear more about the connection between moral imperative and the soul of the school. It, real quick with the soul of the school. So we were drinking heavily in my backyard when we came up with that idea. But <laughs> the, the thought is, the thought is that schools have souls and they have to be tended to. And that goes around with that discussion of culture and the actual like root word in Latin of culture is cultura. And in Latin, it refers to agriculture and tending to the soil and the plants. And so I'm not sure we have a direct connection like ostensibly to um, moral imperative and that, but that is the genesis of what we mean by tending to the soul of school. When my boys were in third and fifth grade, um, I noticed they went to, we lived in a very nice neighborhood north of here, and it was a nice neighborhood, nice school, but I saw a little bit of their light starting to go out, like they were not excited to go to school anymore. Um, one of our co-founders, the great Rob Reardon, would say, be the one who notices, be the one who notices. He has a beautiful story that he tells about that. And I would just submit to you, as we think about the soul of individual people and our young people, to what extent do we notice their talents, their tastes, their interests, their curiosities, the light in their eyes? And how do we like work in such a way as to expand, deepen, grow some of that? In my very first school, Mary McLeod Bethune in Moreno Valley, as I said before, it was a very top-down organization. And first we had to attend to the relationships among the students, because it was fighting every day. We had to attend to the relationships among the teachers, because it was fighting every day. And then we had to t attend to the parents. Guess what? Because it was fighting every day. Um, and we used uh, design to help support, like, how might we, how do we address these dot, 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 dot. And eventually we got to a place where we can actually talk about pedagogy, like what the learning experience looks like with young people. And we, in their minds, we don't have time for that, Caleb. <laughs> but every Friday they had like happy hour. Well, not, not drinking, but like happy hour, like watch a movie at the end of the day if you do all your work. So what we did was say, okay, well, we, everyone like kind of takes this hour or two to just let kids play or watch a movie or whatever. Well, what if we had, that, that was back in the day when Google time was like a big thing, 20% time, do you remember this, right? So I was like, well, well what if we asked the kids, what would they love to do? What would they love to create, make, or design if they had the time to do so. It was a very simple experiment. And we found that there was a day, a Friday, with two hours, and all across our schools, uh, all across the school, um, teachers wrote down all these things that kids wanted to learn about. It was amazing. And then we looked at all of that together, and we said, okay, well, let's organize um, a day, a two-hour period, where the kids could explore whatever they wanted to explore with adult supervision, et cetera. And the kids did such beautiful things. They had fashion shows. They, it was really cute too, by the way. Um, they um, just wanted to design video games. They wanted to do coding. They, were, they had so many wonderful ideas. And so for that day, all around our campus, Kids were making and creating things and sharing their work with people. And the teacher saw, oh, wait a minute, that's amazing. What if we did more of that and did more of that in systemic ways? 
Now, they could not get to that if I wasn't sort of PBLing their adult experience. You know what I'm saying? So I never use meeting times. This is a structural thing. I never use meeting times to relay information. That's boring. Stop doing that. Send that out via email. Let people read it whenever they want to. And when people are together, if the, we believe the genius is here, how are we using that? And so we would PBL their experience, and they felt that, they experienced it, and then they would want to do the same thing with the young people. And my claim to them, would, would uh, our claim together, um, was about you know, how do we do um, uh, right by the young people in this community? We have a moral imperative not to just teach to the test. I would just like name one other thing. In engaging in this work with people, this is to the question about like trying to build this sort of culture piece, they're also gonna let go of something. There's a part of your identity that gets wrapped up into the things you've done before. There's a sense of loss. So um, being aware of like how people grapple individually and collectively with loss and while they're trying to pursue a different version of themselves, this is old school Margaret Wheatley, okay? This is about identity. She calls it something below the green line, right? Below the green line, okay? Identity relationships, and this is Caleb making this part up, but shared purposes, higher purposes. And you don't get to that by mandate. Um, we get to that by dialogue. See that beautiful brother that just walked in the building? Yeah, I'm gonna put you on blast right now. See that beautiful brother right there? That's Brian Delgado. Oh, uh, he, oh, original high tech high teacher designer in this space, learned so much from watching him as a project designer and in my very first uh, days here as a director, I was nervous because they had all these amazing project designers and then they got me, new, trying to quote, lead them to something. And we engaged in constant dialogue with each other. There was a sort of change management question here. And we eventually landed on two things that we wanted to do together related to identity, our relationships with each other and our shared purposes. And we described it as being excellent to each other and doing badass work. That was our thing. And yes, we have to end right there. And it was, <laughs> it, it, and it was like amazing. Do you, you remember this B, right? Yeah, and, and here we were like in this space together, holding these dialogues with each other and then I had just had to step back and say, yo, I don't know what I'm doing. Help me. Who do we want to be together? There were four, three or four focusing questions that supported our dialogue. Um, there were three or four questions that I might offer to you as you are engaging in these dialogues with your people. One is, who are we? Why do we do these things? Why do we do these things this way? Who do we want to become? There's no rushing that dialogue. They're called focusing questions. And form follows function, follows identity. And for this group, for us, I felt like excited every single day to come to work. It was hard, there was a lot of hard stuff, but it was like amazing witnessing us because once we like, like identify, this is who we want to be. And there were some things we did not want to be. That's also a question. But we wanted to be excellent to each other and we wanted to do badass work. Now, when they lifted that up as like, hey, this is what we want. Now the moral, the moral uh, imperative here or the moral responsibility is now you're the custodian of that with your role position authority. You see what I'm saying? So if someone starts acting out of pocket, not being excellent to each other, Somebody's gotta have a conversation. And you stand on the moral, collective um, identification of the group. This is who we are to each other, fam. So you can't show up like that. You see what I'm saying? You gotta have that conversation. And if you don't, then it just ruins your credibility. 
and it erodes the efficacy of the group. So you, there, there's, like, there's like no way around that. You just gotta like do the thing. Um, so can we, can I, I love you. I love you. Can we give him a big round of applause? That's, I, that's Brian Delgado right there. One of my greatest teachers who taught me so much. Thank you, brother. Thanking Eric and Caleb for a great session. High Tech High Unboxed is hosted and edited by me, Alec Patton. Our theme music is by Brother Herschel. Huge thanks to Ben Daly, Caleb Rashad, Eric Chigala, and everyone who made Deeper Learning 2023 possible. We've got references to the resources Caleb mentioned in the show notes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>